welcome to the Modernizer Die Podcast, Soapbox Edition. In this podcast, we take you behind the scenes in the Cold Fusion community. We'll talk to the leaders about what they're working on to push the language forward with tools, frameworks, modules, lessons learned, and best practices. So thanks again for joining me on another Modernizer Die Soapbox Edition. Today we've got episode seven and I'm happy to have Charlie Earhart with me. How you doing, Charlie? Cool. Happy to be here. Thank you, Kevin. Cool. Well, obviously, uh, you're a big name in the Cold Fusion community, so we couldn't go too far without inviting you on here. So I'm I think I'm an old name. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But, uh, for those of you who don't know much about you in the community, uh, obviously, they haven't been uh, out there too much. You've got stuff everywhere. You speak everywhere. You blog everywhere. Um, you're just a, a big Cold Fusion community member. So we thank you for that. But uh, I have to do the you know, the background. So when did you start sure. working with Cold Fusion? Well, that was a long time ago. I, I meant to ask you when you were born. <laughs> when were you born, Gavin? Uh, I just turned 40, so 79. So Okay. Well, it was uh, uh, 7, 16, eight, 18 years after that. So it was like 97. Okay. Um, and I know you uh, also ask um, people what they did before that. And actually it might be more interesting, um, and, and that leads into the cold fusion kind of nicely, so I actually um, started with computers. Gosh, it was in like 81. Um, so, yes, uh, two years after you were born. <laughs> is that right? No, wait. No, you weren't born in 79. 79? Yes, 79. Yep. Wow, 79. Yeah, so two years later, I was there, or a year later, I was in college. And in my uh, second semester, I uh, was really fortunate. The timing it was incredible because had I been just a semester earlier, I would have been learning on an 8-bit blue box with eight switches on the front and that's the way you program was flipping these switches but fortunately i was a semester later and it was on apple ii c yeah apple ii c's so i learned you know basic then and then uh, next year learned fortran and had i been a semester earlier that would have been on punched cards but fortunately it was on a, a terminal so this is all pre you know pcs uh that was a, a couple of years later um you know and then i learned cobol and then assembler and i knew that i loved it i mean i those first, um, you know, year that first year working in the uh, lab with the Apple IIs, I just knew I was, I loved programming. I'd never touched a computer before that. It was great to uh, learn, you know, just to love coding and problem solving, and that's uh, led to my the work. I started working in '83, and that was more in mainframe stuff back then. And um, I got involved in user groups and uh, was writing manuals for people and started speaking at conferences. Um, my first conference was like in 87 and, um, and then I spoke every year, a couple of conferences that went on in that particular mainframe community. And what's cool about it is it was a very, uh, interactive mainframe thing. So, um, it, it was somewhat like, you know, cold fusion, like working with web apps, but it was mainframe stuff. And actually by 90, by 96, I had started, uh, went, went to work in Australia and I know you're from New Zealand. So I stopped in New Zealand on my way there. And I, it's funny, I, I thought there for a weekend thinking, I'll go down to the South Island, hang out for a couple of days and come back up, you know, long weekend. Ha ha ha. You know, that's not feasible. So I've now been back and forth through, through New Zealand three times, staying in Auckland. I've never been anywhere but Auckland. So anyway, yeah. Um, so yeah, I worked in uh, Australia for one of the biggest databases in the world back then in 96, 95, 96. And um, then I came back and started working for a company that was related to this stuff, but they actually had a, uh, a web server. It was a mainframe web server. And so the web is really just starting to take off. And I started working with that. And then I just got somehow attention to Cold Fusion in 97. And I really uh, found I enjoyed it. Again, it was so simple and straightforward compared to a lot of the stuff I dealt with over the years. And so uh, that's how it started. And I, I started working, uh, developing in it for about, two, three years. And then I started teaching it and I went to work for fig leaf in 99 awesome. for about a year and a half, two years. And then I left and went out on my own for training and then started getting into the troubleshooting stuff. And then I went, uh, got, got recruited to go to the new Atlanta to work with blue dragon for a couple of years. And okay. then I left that in 2006 and just focused on the cold fusion troubleshooting ever since. So love okay. it. Been a big fan of it. And, you know, watching everything from blue dragon, which 
back then I was held in ill regard for taking people away from Cold Fusion and then watching Rilo when it came out in 2006, just as I left. And then now Lucy, it's been a, you know, I've been able to watch it all come and go and watch things grow. Very interesting. So happy to be a part of the community and help share perspectives of uh, being an old guy. <laughs> well, yeah, I started when I was a young guy, but uh, still, I've been <laughs> working with it since about 99, I believe. So mm -hmm. it's been 20 years mm -hmm. myself. So, yep. So I've seen a lot of the same stuff, but not as active in the community as you until just recently. But uh, until really, yeah, but now you're kicking butt. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thanks for all you're doing. <laughs> trying to. It's, you know, trying to balance yeah. everything is tough. You know this, but, uh, but yeah, but. Cool. Well, so tell us a little more about the server troubleshooting stuff that you do, you know, day to day. So what's your average day look like and what type of people are you helping and with what problems? Sure. Well, thanks for asking. Um, I love what I do and it's, I've been doing it now for 13 years and, you know, for a dead language, I'm no less busy than I ever have been. And I've got the same number of clients every year and I get a new customer at least once a week. And so my work is really different than a lot of people's. All I do is troubleshoot. So I don't do any development at all. Um, I don't do architecture. I don't do, you know, I just troubleshoot. So I, I always use the analogy. I'm like a, like a you know, firefighter that parachutes into a forest fire. You know, I just get dropped in. I got my backpack. I got my shovel. And my job is to figure out where the fire is going and put it out. And in the case of this sort of troubleshooting, I just work remotely like this, screen sharing all day, every day. And people present just the widest range of challenges that they've run into and you know they've tried to find the answer on their own often and they haven't found it and sometimes you know it's on fire and sometimes it's just driven them crazy and you know there's a lot of uh you know being a counselor in terms of you know, bringing people off the ledge sometimes and saying look we just if we approach the problem very straightforwardly we can look at the diagnostics and you know i literally like 90 percent of the time i'm able to solve the problem um and sometimes it's blows people away that it was something they never would have fathomed. Other times they smack their heads and go, why didn't we think of that? But, you know, I try to teach people as we go. So I love what I do because I don't just fix the problem. I don't come in and wave magic wand and say problem solved. I teach them. We do it interactively. They're driving. I'm guiding them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm even being a bit of a counselor of, you know, you got the people over here pointing the fingers at the people over here. Everybody's saying it's somebody else's problem. And I just go, look, you know, Let's just follow the diagnostics. The evidence is going to be there. So the other analogy I use is like, you know, it's like being a detective and doing police work. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to find the culprit. We're looking at the cameras. We're canvassing the neighborhood. We're, you know, taking, you know, looking at phone logs. We're doing whatever it takes to find out what, why is this problem happening? And the great news is that, you know, after doing it for 13 years, there's often some very clear things, which when they, the average person looks at it, they go, ah, I don't know what to make of it. And I go, well, I can tell where that's, a smell. Let's go follow that train, you know. So it's fun. I love doing what I do and get to do it, you know, pretty much all day, every day. And it's, uh, it's great. So anybody that needs such help, reach out to me. I even have a satisfaction guarantee. So if you don't feel the time we spend is valuable, you won't pay for it. Wow, that's amazing. But yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, right? The more you do of something, the better you get. Uh, so if, yep. I mean, they could spend hours and hours hunting for a yep. problem that might take you one hour of time, you know, and yep. obviously everyone's like consulting fees are high. I mean, mm -hmm. and I've, I think I've seen your fees and they're very reasonable, but the amount of time they would have wasted if they didn't have yep. somebody that you come in. I know that's why everyone, you know, raves about you and that's why you get good word of mouth. And, yeah, thanks. You know. And if people look at the consulting page on my site, you'll see a link for references. And I do, I just get wonderful uh, references from people and um you know I, I i give back about one percent the refund that i do i've vandalized it over the past several years and it's about one percent a year that i refund the time so that's 99 percent of the time they find it valuable and i'm saying that even above that 99 percent about 90 percent of the time we really do solve the problem there's another you know like eight or nine percent where we don't quite find it but i give them often just giving them enough insight into what the problem isn't is valuable enough that they'll often come back to me a week later and say, Oh yeah, 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 we figured out you helped us realize that we were looking in the totally wrong direction and we looked in a different direction and found something. So I love that, that I empower people, you know, it's not just, um, you know, not just the time, but I'm making everybody better at what they do. And again, whether they're using cold fusion or Lucy or whether they're using fusion reactor, or the cold fusion server monitor, the new PMT, C fusion, Java tools, I just want to help people use whatever they have and make the most of it. 
Okay, well, that was my next question too. So obviously uh, you use a lot of these tools um, and I know you present a lot of times on behalf of Fusion Reactor because you got a good relationship with them and I know you use that a lot and it's a, it's a great tool, but I mean, you use whatever they have, right? Because I know yeah. you've done presentations about how to do it without all the fancy tools yep. too. Yep. And we'll talk about this later that um, my CF Camp talk will be reviewing all the different ways you can go about doing troubleshooting with the various tools that are available whatever people have and if they don't have some things i want to help them know that there's others out there um because that's really often what i'm doing is just helping people to realize either they have the diagnostics they didn't know where to look for it or they didn't know how to interpret it or they don't have anything and they need to understand that otherwise it's a black box you got to have something telling mm -hmm. you what's going on so yeah. i help them figure out what the right tool is and um, you know it, it, it'll depend and sometimes they don't have to do anything new. It's just interpreting what they have. So, yeah, I just love to help people solve their problems. Yeah. And that's the other thing, too. Obviously, it's a great learning experience for what you do. And then I like the fact that you share that. So a lot of those little golden nuggets that, you know, that you make your living off of, you share freely on uh, kihat.org, your blog there. And you got a lot of great resources on your site as well for um, just general information about cold fusion and how to find things. And so. Yeah. And that goes back to that, you know, experience from what <laughs> in, in 80, probably 82 was my first, 83 was my first user group. So you know, 30, uh, 36 years ago, I was involved in user groups and that's how I learned to do what I did then. And then of course, in the CF community, starting in the late nineties, very active in the DC CFUG that Figley ran, the Maryland CFUG that Michael Smith ran, um, and then all the conferences that happen. And I've been pretty much uh, speaking at every one of the different, con not every occurrences of the conference, but I've pretty much spoken at every conference one of the times that they had it. And some of them all the time, like every one of the CF summits. And I will talk later about CF camp, but that'll be my seventh time. And I'm just thrilled. I love getting to go to those things and getting to talk to people. And as you said, they, you know, it's all about sharing the knowledge. And so it's often the talks I give have nothing to do with what I do for a living. They're not about troubleshooting. They don't really, you know, help people even know. I've had people go, so what do you do for a living? So, you know, I understand that and that's cool. So I just keep pushing the information out there, sharing it to help people because I learned so much from others and I'm glad to be now, you know, paying it forward as it were. Cool. Sounds good. So obviously you mentioned your first conference in 1987, but that wasn't Cold Fusion related. So when do you think your first Cold Fusion conference was, if you remember right? I know you said you had seven CF camps. Yeah. Well, but the first conference was actually the first Cold Fusion conference. Uh, some people will remember it was in 98 and it was held in Fort Collins, Colorado. Wow. And it was called the, uh, I don't know, the National Cold Fusion Conference. Um, wow. it, it was Roby Sten organized it and a couple other guys. I can't remember right now off the top of my head, but yeah, it was in 98 and, um, it was the first one that was every, you know, everybody from all over. And, um, a lot of folks, old names people would recognize were there. Jer Jeremy Lair was there, um, or at least remotely. I, I can't rec recall because it was 21 years ago, but yeah, so that was the first. And then, you know, um, I believe Michael, turned the Maryland CFUG started to become the uh, called it CFUN CFUN and oh, yeah. then that turned into um, go on what was it the CF United was Elden. yeah CF United right CFUN became CF United that was clever uh, turn of phrase um, and that was you know and then CF Objective uh, about the same time so those are the ones that started to happen frequently and Fig Leaf would have a few different ones over the years and Okay. Yeah, it's funny. I did a blog post once where I counted them all up. There, there was literally like uh, uh, 25 to 30, 40 at that time, different conferences that had happened. There have been so many regional ones, attempted national ones. There was ones in Europe, CF Europe, it was called back in uh, 2002, 2001. Um, then the one Scotch on the Rocks, you know, so again, I'll just say this, if anybody's intrigued and is like, oh, yeah, I remember those, I want to be reminded, um, if you go to my CF411.com, CF411.com, it's a place where I keep lists of resources and tools, and I've got like 170 categories, and one of the categories is Cold Fusion Conferences, and I not only list the current ones and when they're happening and where, but then I list the ones that are no longer and it's fun to look back on that. Same with podcasts. Good for you. You guys are there. But there's yeah. a long list of CF podcasts that have come and gone. 
So I kind of feel like the CF reference librarian, you know, I just keep track of this stuff. Well, and it's, People it's, can find it on their own. Yeah, it's great to have too, you know, like it's good, like you say, to find one place for all of that info. And yeah, I, I love that. I'm always looking at references there. And yeah, I know I, I've, I was wondering if it was on there yet because I hadn't gotten uh, emailed you about it. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. First, uh, from the first day you guys were out, I had you up there. Very Absolutely. cool. And I've been listening to pretty much every episode. I believe I've listened to every episode. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. So thanks again for what you guys are doing. It's great. Yeah. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Yeah. And it was uh, fun to, you know, you guys kept talking about the conference and then talking about the pre cons, and you would be kind of bemused by, Charlie's doing a talk on Docker. I wonder what that's about. So I said, let's, let's talk about it. Let everybody know what it's all about. Yeah, and that, that's uh, another good reason. I mean, it's always good to have you on anyway. But uh, yeah, so obviously you're you're working uh, or at CF Summit, you have the workshop on Docker. So yep. zero to 60 with Docker with Cold Fusion Docker images. And then you also have a session as well. So you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so they're both going to be about getting people started with using the CF Docker images. And for those who don't know, there are Adobe CF Docker images. They don't really um, promote them as well as they could. And that's kind of what started this is I noticed that uh, they had a quite a good um, set of information about using them, but nobody knew about it. Nobody was using them. Nobody was talking about it. So I, um, and then I would have clients bringing up that they were interested and, um, so I started looking into it more and more. And then I thought, hey, I could tell people more about it. And I was planning a, a big, long set of blog posts. And then I thought, well, I should definitely talk about it at a conference. So I put in that proposal early in the summer and that got accepted. And then um, some may know that last year I did a, a pre-con, you know, because Pete does his one on security. And last year I did one on um, troubleshooting. And of course, that's right in my wheelhouse. I love doing it. It was very popular. It was like 100 people. It was a big room full of people. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to do it again this year. And I was tempted. And by the way, Nolan did um, his talks as well. Uh, I think it was Angular yep. last year. I helped him with but that. But anyway, um, yeah, there you go. And then before, um, anyway, so I um, I was tempted to do the one on troubleshooting because, you know, pizza are very popular. People enjoy it. And it's good to establish, you know, your place in that particular. But here again, I was like, well, that. I'd like to do that, but I really think this would be interesting to talk about the CF images because um, people didn't understand it. And, and it, um, trust me, I talk to people every day in the community and among my clients. There's a lot of people that have no idea about using Docker at all. So they don't know about the Ordis images. They don't know about the Lucy images. They don't know about the Gold Fusion images. So they don't know anything and they need to be led there. And those who've been there, and I know some people are like, hey, I've been doing it for five years, or four years, three years, two years. Um, there's a lot of people that it's all very new to them and they don't understand, you know, why are there different ones? They don't understand why would I consider using Docker? What can I get out of it? What, what, you know, what, what are the differences? So the goal of the, the hour long talk will be just to presume that people know nothing and to say, you know, here's what you can do with Docker images in general. And I'm not going to really, I only have, you know, 50 minutes. So I'm not going to get too deep into the typical stuff that people do when they're introducing Docker. Cause I'm going to, that's a zero to 60. I want to go right into, look, you know, just you can read more about the how to get started with it stuff later on your own. There's great resources. You, um, I don't know if you guys, you know, that uh, Brett Fisher spoke mm -hmm. at uh, Miracon. Yep. I think it was two years ago. Well, Brett's gone on now to be, you know, become really the guy for introducing people to Docker. Yeah, and I've Swarm. got both his courses on Udemy. Absolutely. Yeah, great absolutely. Courses. And I've, I've heard, I've been through most of both of them. And I watch each of his uh, weekly YouTube um live shows that he does. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's great. Uh, I really enjoy what he does. Um, anyway, um, so I would point people to those resources and say, look, there's other places where you can get more up to speed. But insofar as this hour long talk, I'm just going to talk about wh why would you do it? How would you do it? What are going to be the benefits of doing it? And, um, you know, just wet people's whistle basically to say, you know, now I'll take this ball and run with it. And that was going to be it. And then when they asked me about doing a pre-con, by then I had had some time and I thought, you know, this could, I could, I could cover a lot more. And again, not even just the, how do you get started with stuff, but just a lot more subtlety. Like when you start to use them, there's issues with using Docker images for anybody with anything, there's little subtleties. And then certainly when you get into you know, um, compose, there's more. And again, I know I'm going over the head of people that don't know what I'm talking about, but that's what I'll cover in the talk. Um, I'll talk about that too, because using compose makes it easier to work with multiple 
images and, and to have them communicate with each other. Again, we don't have time really in, in this brief introduction to make the dots connect well. Just take our word for it that once you see it, that's the goal. That's why I want to do this talk. Once you see it, you go, wow, that's really cool. I didn't know it was that easy. And look at all these things that you can do. Yeah. Um, and then you get into Swarm and, and spinning up multiple instances and doing resource constraints and um, secrets and all those sort of things. So again, I don't want to give away too much. Um, I don't know how much else you wanted to talk about later, but you know that's what I'm going to try to cover in that hour long, you know, 50 minute one is just to kind of wet people's whistle to see what's possible and to lead them to want to learn more. And then I thought, well, I could cover more if I had more time. And when they offered me the opportunity to do a pre-con, I said, well, how about that? And they liked that idea. So that one will go slower, but it'll go into that same level of depth and some more. And in that one, I'll also show the Ordis images and um, talk about some of the differences. Um, because, you know, my promoting the CF images is not to, den to denigrate the Ordis images. Um, people sometimes don't know about either. but if anybody looks into Cold Fusion and Docker, and even Lucy and Docker, for the past couple, two, three years, they're going to find the orders images and and the talks that various people and, and articles that have been done. You know, Matt and um, uh, I think Michael and um, sorry, I can't remember right now all the different people that have done stuff. But the point is, there's plenty of resources out there. They they don't need help with that. There's that that's what you guys have been doing a great job with. You really do do and the roadshow uh, was that in mid 2018, I believe. Yeah, I believe. Or was it 2017? So, yep. Yeah. So that's great. And I'm going to point people to all those things and say, you know, there you can learn from everybody. Everybody's got a different perspective. But the thing was is that all those we're talking about using the command box based uh, you know approach with its image and. There's value to that, but I wanted people to see that Adobe provided these images, and those images, you know, they're they're bigger, they're slower in terms of starting up. Adobe knows that. Um, some of you know, and you all brought up on the recent um, episode of Modern Azure Die that uh, they had had uh, uh, on the CF Alive podcast. Uh, there, there had been an uh, a review, an interview with the CF product engineering manager, new CF product engineering manager, and he talked a lot about how that uh, they were going to be addressing in 20, CF 2020, making the images smaller, making them start faster, and addressing the licensing issues. Um, so those are all things I'll touch on as well, of course, in both presentations. But with that you know, addressed, they could be compelling to people who, if they're looking at the two, um, they might find the CF ones more compelling. But I'll tell you, you know, as an orders person, and I assume a lot of people have not even looked at the CF ones because they just figure I don't need to. I can use the orders images. Um, you know, the orders images are based on war uh, deployment under the covers, and there can be differences there. But more importantly, the CF images do much more than just CF. There's a, a uh, add-on services image. There's the API manager image. There's a PMT for the performance monitoring tool kit image. So somebody who wants to explore those various things, they can do all that in Docker on, um, you know, easily. And again, it'll, it'll become more clear. If you don't know really anything about Docker, just take my word for it. If you see anybody's presentation on it, you'll, you'll learn to appreciate what the value is and how easy it is to work with images and why it's beneficial from testing things to trying things out to, um, you know, continuous integration deployment to production, there's benefits to using containers and orchestration. And I'll touch on those kind of high level things in the hour long, and then I'll go into much more depth and show and really, uh, I'll show in the presentation, but I'll, we'll do it together uh, as a group in the, day, in the day long conference. And people will definitely come away saying, I got this, I can do this. And, and they'll see both kinds and they can decide if they want to uh, play with either one of them. Yeah, no, uh, I get that. And obviously, I, uh, I was actually, I signed up to be a TA just to help with whatever. And I was kind of hoping I'd get TA in yours because yeah. I'm kind of curious about, uh, yeah, you know, what they've done. Because two years ago, I believe, at CF Summit, or maybe it was even three, they had a session on how you could build Cold Fusion into a CF image, you know, sorry, into a Docker image. And then the previous, Yourself. the year after, yeah. they talked about their images and they were coming. And then, you know, and then, 
a lot of questions came around, you know, some of the licensing stuff. And I'm glad yep. they're finally getting there because I know at last year's Roadshow, I believe, uh, you know, I talked to Rec Chief and Alicia about it, and they weren't sure what the <laughs> what the situation was. And like, well, how are we supposed to get our customers to use them if you guys don't? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, the licensing and you know, there's a a lot to it. So, well, and we should point out that for development, it's free. So just like, you know, you don't have to pay Adobe a dime to get ColdFusion and start playing with it. And for a lot of people, that's the beginning of their working with it. And of course, same with Lucy, totally. And using Command Box makes both easier. But anyway, with regard to CF itself, you know, the developer edition has always been free. And some people do development locally, and then they deploy onto a hosted solution, or they deploy in a work environment. So they don't ever pay for it. So the licensing sometimes is, is held by some people to think that to be the this terrible thing that makes CF not worth looking at. But, you know, there's a lot of people that spend their days using CF and never pay a dime to Adobe because they just do development or they and they deploy it elsewhere or they have hosting or they have a server somewhere. And now with Docker images, the point is you can use the, the ColdFusion Docker images for free for development. And there's a lot of people that that's all they do with Docker images anyway. Again, I know we're getting... Um, ahead of people who have no idea what Docker images are about. But those of you guys who do do work with containers, you know that you might, you know, 50 to 90% of the work you do with containers is going to be in development. And only some people do deployment. And there's a lot of people that never do deployment. They're just using it for the benefits it gives them for testing. And then they, you know, do other forms of deployment that have nothing to do with the Docker images. But you can also absolutely take these images and containers built from them and use them in deployment, I mean, Kubernetes on Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, all those are possible for those that want to go that way. But I'm just going to say that people can get a lot of mileage out of even the, quote, paid Adobe images and never pay a dime because they're free for development. And, yeah. you know, we'll see what they give you and how they work. Um, I'll tell you another example of something. You know, there's some things they thought of that are actually pretty cool. Um, people often grumble, how am I supposed to configure my container? Uh, and, and you mentioned how originally people would just build things from scratch. They would build, you know, install ColdFusion and then build a container from it. But now these these images, the uh, you know, one from Adobe, they're just pre-configured, already installed. You just start the container, you know, run the image and boom, it's running. But then, you know, how do you get it to be configured? And so you can, you know, use the admin API, of course, um, they provided for, for those who know what ColdFusion archives are, are, you can build from the administrator, uh, export of data sources and scheduled tasks, things like that. Well, if you build a car and put it in a directory that's identified in the startup of the images and you have a volume pointing to it, again, that'll make sense for those that use it. <laughs> boom, it'll automatically import the car file or any car files that are there. Um, and there's provision to point to a startup script and that script could run CFML using the admin API and do anything else that you want. Um, and then like for Fusion Reactor, as an example, the way it's implemented is as a Java agent. So you've got to be able to manipulate the JVM config to put the Java agent in. Well, if anybody's interested in that, if you go to, if you just Google Fusion Reactor um, Docker, you'll see that for a couple of years, they've been talking about how to do it with Lucy, but they never talked about how to do it with Cold Fusion. Um, and partly it was because they didn't know that the cold fusion images were there. They came out in mid 2018, I believe. So they just didn't, you know, nobody was paying attention to that, um, who was managing that fusion reactor Docker page, but it's a GitHub, um, resource and project. And I put up there, uh, last week, two weeks ago, how to do it. And all you got to do is use, you know, the Linux said command to script the appending of the Java agent to the JVM args. It's really, once you know what to do, it's pretty simple. So bam, now you're able to do that. Now the Ordis containers make it even still easier, but they do it based on command box. So again, whenever anybody would read about doing this stuff, they would read about how to do it the command box way and the Ordis image way. But if somebody wanted to use pure Lucy images or pure cold fusion images, they were stuck. Uh, what am I supposed to do now? So that's why I'm picking this ball up. And it's really not to um, say that people should use this and not those. It's just that there's been a lot of great resources about using those and really virtually nothing about not using those. So I'm just trying to help fill in that gap. That's all. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I mean, Brad, if he was here, he would still say, well, you could still use command box and CF config to import your settings, you know, Absolutely. whatnot. So you could still do that on top of their images, uh, you know, as part of the init script, the run script. And, and that's right. We should make that clear because people do often misconstrue that CF config only works with command box yeah. and it doesn't. So one could use CF config. And I should have said that. Oh, I'll okay. try to remember. I, I think I have it in my notes to cover. Um, but I just didn't think to mention it here. But yeah, it's a great point. One could use CF Config, and that is a wonderful tool, and um, people really should explore it and don't think of it as only a command box tool. And again, just saying that could be read by some people as saying, well, what do you mean? Don't see it as a command box tool. But you know, when you stop and think about it, there's a lot of people that, that they're not coming from that perspective. They're yeah. coming in as, I got a problem to solve. And if they, you know, they could be shown the wonders of command box, but maybe say, but I can't use it or it doesn't make sense to me or I can't get someone to go that route or whatever. Though the beauty of CF config is that it doesn't require that. So that's all I mean to say is that don't believe that you've got to be um, using command box to benefit from it. So you made that point and I'm just saying, don't people misconstrue it. it mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll be able to do that even if you want uh, with just the CF images and also more importantly with any CF or Lucy administrator, which is really, really cool tool. So hats off to that effort and of course all you guys do you guys do so many wonderful things so thanks again and especially for the podcast yeah no problem um so when did you start working with docker i mean i know obviously you don't do much development now but you're helping a lot of clients is that just something that right. you naturally just came into and you yeah, yeah this came up as part of as i was working with people i'd had people asking about hey how could i deploy to you know the various um cloud computing platforms and for so long you know, I would tell people, well, you could install, you know, you just get a VM in any of the platforms and install ColdFusion yourself. And some people know that uh, Adobe's had an AWS AMI, Amazon Machine Image. And so that was a, a different way to just quote, automatically deploy that. But um, that didn't suit everybody. It was an enterprise. It was a monthly license. It might have suited some people well, but it didn't suit everybody. So there was this kind of gap of like, okay, so I could either use that or build my own VMs. And as people learn more and more about Docker, they would sometimes say, well, hey, I see I can you know, use uh, either of the Kubernetes engines of any of those platforms, or not even Kubernetes, just using Docker container. You know, there's, there's Amazon container service and Azure container service. So um, it was just a natural place to, to lead people to. And um, yeah, it's okay. been fun. Cool. Well, it sounds pretty interesting. I mean, is there anything else you want to share about the CF images that we should uh, spotlight now? Just, I mean, obviously no, you I covered quite a lot. We're saying, you know, there's obviously different flavors and everything. And, and you're right, the wire uh, install with command box allows you to run any wire. So that's how we install it. But um, yeah, things like the API manager and the, the performance tools and everything, having those images is pretty neat. And obviously they've yeah. got the command scripts and stuff. So And environment um, variables to set things up. And there's some gaps. There's some things. There's flaws. I've found problems and I've brought them up. In fact, I'll mention, you know, this is another thing I want to add to the, to the show notes. A lot of people don't know that the tracker, tracker.adobe.com, you can use that not only to file bug reports and feature requests about cold fusion, but you can also do it about the Docker images. You can do it about tracker itself. <laughs> you can do it about the um, um, portal itself. So they do have these categories. And I did a blog post about three or four weeks ago pointing that I think you guys mentioned that. Yep. Um, so yeah, you want to be aware that, you know, if you trip over something, that feels like a bug then open, or needs a feature request, then go ahead and open a tracker item. And then certainly, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the community develop to start talking about it. There really isn't much um, discussion out there about the CF images and I'm looking forward to leading that. And some of it will, you know, has already started with some blog posts, but I'll do a lot more afterwards. I was torn, you know, how much should I do beforehand and after who, who will benefit? I'm just, I'm still figuring that out. It's you know, still about three weeks away. so. Um, I may trickle out some more before then. Yeah, you don't want to give them too much, you know. <laughs> but I think it well, would be... Well, I'm torn. I mean, a part of me does because then it helps make them be a little more prepared. But with the day-long thing, my goal is really to take people from assuming they know nothing. So I just don't I don't need to uh, do that. But I'm, I'm tempted to because I want to get the word out sooner. But even if I don't, then I will certainly be doing it afterwards. And I'll, 
um, share a lot more detail. And there's so much to get into. We've all, you know, we've, we've just touched the surface. We've left out a lot of stuff that isn't um, what makes this stuff cool and fun. And, and I'll cover that for sure. And in the meantime, again, if anybody that has their interest peaked, certainly you can look and, and let's do that too in the show notes. We'll give you the URL. Well, yeah, you gave me, we put in my blog post, in my blog post, I point to the Adobe page on the Docker images and it's a pretty substantial page of information that leads you literally from starting from doing nothing to having a CF image running to having a, a compose with CF and the add-on services or CF and the PMT. Um, and I think they even show an example of pulling in a uh, MySQL image as well and having that talk. And so I'm just going to say that if somebody's interested in this stuff and either isn't going to attend or wants to get started right away, uh, just you know, look around. You'll find either the, that or some things I've done. And then the things that have been out there for a while, talking about it from the context of the Ortis images. And there's even some stuff out there about the Lucy provided images. You know, one can get a lot of insight and information that's even relatively specific to the CF community, but you don't even need that. I mean, there's plenty of resources out there that uh, do a great job of introducing people. And again, in my talk and eventually in blog posts, I'll give pointers to several of those, some of which some people will well know and others, they'll be shocked that there's such good stuff out there that could take them by the hand and get them going. So that's, that's the goal. And it's all just a journey. It's really just like the journey a lot of people made in CF. There have been wonderful resources over the years, some that are still actively updated, some that are long gone and haven't been updated in years, for instance. But everybody's just going to make their way along the way, and I just want to help a little bit. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, obviously, I use the oldest ones. And as we've worked with clients over the time, we've built them. If there's something missing, then, you know, we add it and everything. Sure. And, and so. And it's fun. It's fun yeah. working with it, right? Yeah. Solving problems and yep. helping people do their deployments. And, and you know, the, I'm going to stress this, too. I mean, there's so many things. And again, the command box has always given people this, whether they use Docker or not. With command box, just for those familiar with it, you know how easily you could be, you know, have the folder and say, okay, here's my code. I want to run it against CF 2018. I want to run it against Lucy 5. I want to run it against CF 10. You could just, you know, do that on a dime easily with command box. And that's part of what thrills people. Well, you yeah. can do that with Docker images as well. You can have a Docker image that starts literally sometimes in, in some ways within seconds and have it pointing at a code base and you're running that code against this version of the CF Docker image, then against that. And in the case of the CF images, they currently only have them for CF 2018 and 2016. So they're okay. never going to do one for 11 or earlier. You mentioned people had built them. There are out there on the web, you'll find people that have, uh, and at Docker Hub, have put out CF images that they built themselves. You might be a little suspect of something that somebody else built, but these are from Adobe. Yours are from Ortis, and you guys cover several different versions Yep, um, any command box version that you can yeah. run, you can run inside of command box. Um, so it's it's pretty neat. I mean, but like you say, obviously the the whole fusion ones are built specifically, and like I said, I, I want to find out more about it, see what they're doing that we can incorporate. Because I mean, if they're good enough, then we might build the Adobe versions on top of that. You know, like it, it might be something that we look at as well. So even though command box can do that, we could still build on top of it. So or take them know. apart and use them <clears throat> in a way that you wouldn't have. Um, you know, I understand the challenge that was faced originally with Command Box was it needed to be a you know cross-platform approach. For those who don't know, Docker images tend to be Linux-based. Now, I've saved that here towards the end because nobody should be scared away by that. The way you run your code, you know, 99% of it, it doesn't matter that it's running in Linux. The key is that if you've been scared away from using Linux because you just never used it before, you're not using Linux when you use a container that's built in Linux. You just you just run it. Again, it'll be more clear when you see demos of it, but you just run the container and point it to your code and it just runs. It's like you've got this pre-built CF that's running. And it happens to be that the, currently the CF containers are built in Linux, so they run as Linux containers. But one can even run Docker desktop for Windows and be running the Cold Fusion image even though it's built in Linux. That doesn't matter. It's just fascinating when you start to get into this stuff to realize how it's changing the way people look at things and things that were previously roadblocks. Even to the point, like I said, of being able, like if you wanted to run CF 2018, 2016, and Lucy 
all at once, and let's say you didn't have command box, then in your brain, you're thinking you've got to install each of those. Again, command box made it so you don't have to install them. But with Docker, you can get each of those images and you can just run them and you can be running your code against them. Or if you're trying to understand how do things differ, where well, you can just do some testing in one, just in the other. You can have them both running at the same time. You don't have to worry about installing CF. You don't have to worry about port conflicts because that's all hidden. Again, I won't try to explain how now, but all that stuff is well managed by Docker. And that's the power of it is that it solves problems that we're not alone in having wanted to solve as CF people, yeah. .NET people, PHP people, Node people. They've all had these similar kind of problems um, with dependencies and different versions and how do you just support things. And of course, VMs were a classic way to try to solve it, but they're heavyweight and these are not. And you know, that's when you read a lot of people's introductions to Docker, they try to cast it in the context of how does it relate to a VM? And that can be sometimes helpful, sometimes not. Yeah, Again, my I, goal when I do it is I'm going to say, don't even worry about that. Just look, you just do these commands and it works and you'll be able to try this yourself and you see how easy it works. And that's all that matters. Don't for now, when you're getting started, don't worry about the underpinnings and other, other stuff. But go ahead. You were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, yeah, basically the cool thing about Docker is now for a lot of companies that were getting a lot of blowback for using cold fusion because their DevOps people didn't know how to use it. Now I, it's just a, it's a bundled piece of code. Yeah. They yeah. just throw it up on wherever they want to deploy it. And now their DevOps people don't need to know, like, how do I deploy this? How do you set up the data sources? Infrastructure is code. Yeah. Yep, it's all code, and it just deploys. And so that actually should help ColdFusion as a language, I think, because I think it takes away a lot of those hurdles for those people who are, you know, having issues. Because I know Ben Adel said that his DevOps people for the longest time, you know, always, you know, gave him funny looks every time they're doing some cold fusion and everything. Sure. And, you know, and, and they're, they were just saying, it's like, well, now my DevOps team, you know, with Docker, it's not an issue. And I've, yep. I've seen that from a few people. So I think that's another interesting point too. Whether you use it or not, uh, you know, it's, it's basically making your app a packageable thing that you can just, you know, deploy. And it doesn't matter where you're deploying it to as much. It doesn't matter, you know, you don't have to have old school server guys working on it. A DevOps person can sort of take that and run. And, Absolutely. and yeah. And like you said, people and are some deploying will point also. out that, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, some people were, you know, you, you know, people are running React stuff and Node and Ruby sure. and Cold Fusion and to the DevOps person, it's just a Docker image. They don't care as much right. anymore. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that'll become more clear as people start working with it. What I was going to say is that some will remember that this was supposed to be the promise of war file deployment. That, you know, starting with CF 6.1, uh, I believe it was, you could build CF as a war file or an ear and deploy it on any Java container. WebLogic, WebSphere, JBoss, didn't matter. That just never really took off. But the goal was to say to those Java infrastructure people, hey, you don't need to worry about it. It doesn't matter what language it's written in. It doesn't matter that it's this thing called Cold Fusion. It's just a war file. Boom. Take this war file, please, and deploy it. And it did work. And I used to be involved in helping folks do that. Um, it's funny. I just was reading a, a, a kind of a retrospective of technology, and it was talking about how um, – Java server, Java application servers were really um, led by Wall Street. And I was remembering that, yeah, actually, I, I was literally up in um, Wall Street in New York in about 2004, helping people deploy CFML onto a WebLogic server in uh, one of the um, major investment companies. So they got it and they benefited from it. And others did, too. Over, over the next few years back then, it was pretty compelling. But it, that whole thing just never really took off. And so then we kind of fell back into um, the silos of uh, installers and OS wars and <laughs> VMs. And so really uh, Docker, that, that's the part where for those that to whom this is all new, it's a, it's really a whole new world. And it, and you, when you get into it, you may immediately recognize the benefits because you've struggled with problems that it solves. And even if you don't, you'll see that there's a lot of people getting excited about it. And the reason is, is it solves a lot of problems that they have. And you may, but let's put this out there. You as a CF developer, you, some of you may don't even benefit from it. You won't ever use it. And heck, you might even have your stuff deployed that way and you won't know it because it's really just a different way to deploy your stuff. You could be, um, you know, unaware potentially of it, especially if you're using, you know, um, more automated forms of deployment where, you might do your development over here, and then in the end, it's deployed over there. The fact that it's running in containers and an orchestration 
would be, it doesn't matter to you, right? I mean, you just wrote the code. That's all that matters. It's, it's, but, yeah. but boy, in, in between, there's a world of benefit for those getting to that point and then even for those just doing development to try yeah. things out and to see what's possible. I mean, heck, it's even, just for those who don't know, it's even for something like a database. You know, you can have, pick a database server, like SQL Server is pretty popular in the CF community. You could have a SQL Server image that's running stuff that you're sending to it from Cold Fusion or .NET or PHP, it doesn't matter. And it could be SQL Server 2016, and it's pointing to a database that's on a file system. And the person who's managing that can say, I want to start up a SQL Server 2019 image pointing at that same database. When they start that image pointing at that database, within seconds, it's up. And when you look at the logs, you'll see that it upgraded the database from SQL Server 2016 to SQL Server 2019. Nobody had to do anything. They yeah. just started an image and it took care of it. Yeah, something you know, as simple as not having to update your server anymore because you just installed the new version. You just yeah. point it at the right Docker image, and now it's patched. No more and patching. we should say that, right, that's true for the Cold Fusion ones. There's a 2018, 04, 03, 02, 01, 2016, uh, whatever it was, 11, 10. The, uh, each, one, the, each of those is a different image. And so when you want to move to a new version, you just go get that new image. And I'll just throw out there for those who may get excited and go looking for it, if you go to Docker Hub, which is the classic place where Docker images are stored, the Cold Fusion images aren't there. Um, Adobe, I, th I think it was the licensing issue that cost them a lot of money to put the Docker images on Docker Hub. So unfortunately, they're not there, but they're on something called bin tray, bin tray. And again, if you just follow the in the show notes, uh, my blog post takes you to the information for all that. And the, the point is, though, they're there and you just in your, you know, when you're running stuff in Docker, you just can literally say Docker run and point to the Let's say, let's say next week they come out with a new one for CFF 2018 update five. You'll just say Docker run point to 2018.05, hit enter. And it'll download it. And unfortunately right now the CF ones are pretty big, several hundred meg. And that's kind of crazy in the world of Docker. But heck, if you haven't looked at it, the SQL Server ones are even bigger. And the you know IIS ones yeah. are even bigger. It's crazy. So these are things that will improve over time. It's relatively new. Uh, and there's various reasons why things are the way they are. But I mentioned earlier that Adobe has said they're going to make the images for Cold Fusion be smaller. They understand they need to. And I believe he said the goal was to be under 100 meg for the images and for them to be able to start up in seconds. So right uh, now it would take impressive. a while to download. Yeah, that's their goal. So yeah. that's going to be good. Yeah, I mean, once you put, pile on all the stuff too, like some of our installs get pretty big, you know, even running Lucy, which is smaller. But, you know, when you get all the extensions installed that you want and all the different pieces yeah. and it's fully ex exploded, you know, yeah. like they, they get pretty big. So, uh, you know, I, I understand. I mean, it's great that they're working towards that and it sounds pretty exciting. But you guys do a cool thing, you know, I, know, I think it was Brad that was involved in this of making the option for them to be warmed up. Mm -hmm. And I apologize if it wasn't Brad, uh, John might have been the one, but somebody did that. It was clever. And that's what Adobe needs to do, too, is offer that option. Um, you know, I know it's, again, let's not get into the details of what it means to warm it up, but there's some things that happen in the background that if they could be done already, it just makes it start faster. Yep, for sure. And you can also stop and start images without deleting them so that you could stop it, shut everything down. It has no impact on your server, computer, your laptop, whatever. And then later you say, I do want to start it up. And it just starts up because you're not really restarting. You're kind of re restarting it from a paused state. So that's an opportunity. Um, and let's also throw out for those who maybe get really excited and think, I want to do this. But uh, like, let's say you're on Windows and you find out that the Windows Docker, Docker for desktop only works with um, Windows Pro and you don't have Windows Pro. There's solutions to that. There's something else available called the Docker Toolbox. But just go check out playwithdocker.com, play-with-docker.com. It's a site that once you – it's free. You just go there and create an account, and now you can do this stuff we're talking about there. And it lasts for four hours, and you can try stuff out, and you can see how easy it is and play with different images from different people. You just pull them down from anywhere. You can pull down the Cold Fusion images. And I'll be showing that for sure in my talks. And, and in the day long, because maybe there's going to be somebody there, you know, you and I have been doing these pre-conferences long enough. There's going to be somebody that 
something doesn't work, their computer, they didn't set it up in advance the way we told them to. And I'll be able to tell them, look, as long as you got an internet connection, and even if the internet doesn't work there, use your phone to tether your Wi-Fi connection. It doesn't, you, you're not going to be sending a lot of bandwidth at all. Mm-hmm. It's just a terminal interface to play with Docker. And when you tell it to go download the CF image at several hundred meg, that'll happen within a matter of, you know, about 20, 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and it's done. But it's not on you. It's on that Play With Docker site. So Yeah, I love that site. It's a great tool. It is great. And there's a Play With Kubernetes as well. And, and there's some other ones out there, Coda and stuff like that. So we'll talk about some of those in more detail. Cool. Well, but well, yeah, there's lots of ways to play with this stuff, and it's exciting. Yeah, for sure. And they really work with it and benefit from it in the long run. Yeah, like I said, I'm excited. Uh, and if I'm, yeah, if, I think I'm TAing for the, the CF Specialist uh, certification. But uh, if they want to move me, I'll be happy to go to your one and help out too. Because uh, there's uh, a lot of people in those specialists. I believe they've got two or three, four rooms oh, with wow. like 40 people in each room. So they, they're going to need, probably need you. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe something will change. People don't show up or something smooths out and they find it's just going really smoothly. Because with yeah. that, they're expecting everybody to have watched all the videos beforehand. So there may not be as much to do in the day. that That's an interesting thing. Um, I've been tangentially involved. Um, they knew that I couldn't really be fully involved because I was doing my own thing. So I've been attending the meetings and participating in some of the um, interchanges and the information. Put in. it's, I, I could see from the beginning, this is going to be a daunting thing because they're creating a certification with questions, with videos that people need to see up front, and then ma- wrangling the cats to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do beforehand because we all know that on the day at the pre-cons, there's almost always something that goes amiss. So I sure hope it goes smoothly. I almost kind of wish they'd offered it for free for the first one because there was so much interest. (laughs) People have paid for it now. It's got to deliver. So there's a lot of moving parts, and I I do hope it goes well. And I know that the people behind it are being very um, sincere about trying to make it work, but it's just it's a daunting task. Yep. Mine's well, going to be simpler by, <laughs> by far, by comparison, and I like to keep it that way. Well, it sounds like a great workshop. I'm sure everyone's going to enjoy it. And if they've already got their travel plans booked then, uh, and they yeah. can't make it, uh, the one-hour session sounds great, and obviously you'll have a lot of blog content. And we will link and I'll in- repeat that somewhere online for sure. I'll find a way to repeat that. And I might ultimately turn that day-long into a, an online class offered some way. There's various ways to do that. I may do that. Very cool. But uh, also, before we go, I do want to sneak in some time because obviously we've been talking about CF Summit, but you're also speaking at CF Camp as well. So you want to tell us a little bit about that session real quick? Yeah, so I alluded to it a bit earlier. Some will remember. It was a while ago. (laughs) So um, it's going to be on. uh, So often when I go to CF Camp, I'm going there to speak uh, either on my own, like say the Hidden Gems and CF 2018 or 2016, and then often for Fusion Reactor, which they're great guys, love to help them out. Uh, as are the others, you know, see Fusion, those folks are great guys too. But anyway, the point is they're in Germany and that's where the conference is. So I would go over there and often speak on their behalf. This time I'm not, they're not, they're not having a, such a slot, at least not currently. So this is just me going on my own. And I went ahead and put in for a talk on um, troubleshooting Cold Fusion and Lucy with various tools. And so I'll, talk a little bit about Fusion Reactor, a little bit about C-Fusion, a little bit about CS Server Monitor, PMT, um, the available features in each of CF and Lucy, and then especially also uh, Java-based tools that are available. And so some of this stuff is very, very old news to some people, but I'm telling you, I spend time with people every day, and there's a lot of people who don't know about any options available for monitoring their environment. So it's easy to fall into thinking everybody already knows all this stuff and get jaded and think there's no point talking about fundamentals and basics. But I'm just telling you, in the nature of the work that I do with the different clients that I've talked to, about 200 different clients a year, um, and then in all that involvement on the community, you know, especially the broad CF community, you know, you just get people from all walks there and Mm -hmm. they're not clued often into something. So, you know, The folks that gravitate with Ortis, they've already kind of drank the Kool-Aid. They understand they're there to become modernized, and they uh, have probably leveraged a lot of the great resources that you have, and they already understand a lot. But there's a lot of people who don't, and you may they may not come to you until they're brand new. And then you have like the wonderful book that uh, Luis just came out with, CF Mill, 100 minutes, and you've got all the other resources. But insofar as you know, just monitoring in particular, I find that 
often people don't know about even basic things that are available um, from things inside of CF and Lucy to things you can easily add to things in Java. So I'll be covering those just to make people aware of them, of the options and decide for them what makes sense. Yeah, and they're they're great tools to have even in development too. You know, it may not be a production server yeah. guy and you help with servers, but I mean, we use Fusion Raptor every day. You know, yeah. without it, like my development life would be a lot tougher. I mean, and then Fusion Reactor has some cool stuff too. Like when you're running your tests, if you're running tests, uh, code coverage is built in with Fusion Reactor and Test Box now. So when you run your tests, Fusion Reactor keeps track of which files were accessed and which lines, and it can tell you, you know, how many how many lines of code, like percentage wise, were actually tested in your test run. There's stuff like that too. That you know, so. Yeah, I mean, they're great tools. Uh, NOC Fusion does a lot of cool stuff, too. Uh, we use Fusion Reactor a lot ourselves. But, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff and anything to make our jobs easier, right? So I think it's a, a good session. And uh, and I think I just heard that they're going to be recording sessions, so I might be able to pick that That's one their up. their goal. That is their goal. So, yeah. Yep. Now, whether they'll be available to everybody, I think what they did last year is that they, I think they charged $99 to get access to this. The, other than the two keynotes, you had to pay. And that's fair. You know, you, you can't, yeah. if you give it away, then people don't want to come. But it's, and as with CF Summit and CF Camp and the ones before, there's so much value in going to the conferences. They're great experiences from the topics themselves to the people you get to talk to, presenters, of course, but even uh, the vendors. And Adobe goes to Summit in full. Um, Lucy is in full at CF Camp. There's some CF people there. Um, the vendors like Fusion Reactor and CMS companies and CRM companies, you know, there's, there's it's hosting companies. You get to really find out a lot about what's going on in the community. And then just the fun of meeting your colleagues and meeting people that maybe you find out you have some great interests in and people go to dinners and have lunch together. It's just great. It's just great. And, and some of you know this, but some, I'm telling you, I work with people all the time. They've never been to one, so yeah. they need to be told. These things are great. You got to go you hear people talk about it. They're not being paid to say how much fun they have and how much value they get out of it. They, they really do get a lot of value out of it. So yeah, exactly. Make- yeah. Uh, CF Summit's great and CF Camp sounds amazing. And I said, hopefully maybe one day next year I can uh, make it to CF Camp as well. Scotch on the rocks. I was going to go and they stopped having them. Yeah. That was yeah. the year I was going to go. Oh, <laughs> man. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, CF Cramp is great. It's you know each one of them has their own flavor and they're great in their own way. And, uh, but but you know I've I honestly haven't heard anybody go, oh, that was a waste of my time for any of them. Um, there, there's been unique value for each one, and and they're cool to be able to go to as many as you can because they're not the same. Even if it's a handful of the same talks that are at each one, there's four times more that are not at this, each one. So you're gonna get value for sure if you go to any of them. So definitely for those who haven't, you know, find a way to make it there to all of them. You know, get out to CS Summit, get out to CF Camp, and if others like NC DevCon and CF Objective get started up again, go check those out. Yep. And then, yeah, I mean, obviously our own conference into the box is and, a lot of... Of course, into the box. Yeah. Sorry. No, no I, problem. I, I was going to say. <laughs> no I was problem. trying to think in my brain, was there something? I feel like there's something I didn't mention. Yes, into the box. I mean, again, its own unique flavor. Yep. And people often think, well, I'm not into using box stuff. And so they think it doesn't matter to them. And it's like, no, 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 no. Look at the list of topics. Yeah, there that's what I was going to so say. Great stuff. Yeah, even though a lot of the speakers speak at all three they're speaking on different stuff and new stuff and there's so much out there. I'm, I'm amazed how much different stuff there is. I'm doing a new talk at CF Sam. I got to po- put some polish on that before I get there too. So, I mean, a lot of new stuff coming out. So yeah, very cool. But uh, I know we don't have enough time today, but uh, I know that you've been talking a lot on the, the Adobe forums about the, the Euler and some of the controversial stuff. So uh, maybe we'll have you back for another episode. And we can talk about that some more. Yeah, yeah, it's been an interesting time and disappointing to see some of what's been going on recently. Um, it may not affect everybody, but it's affecting some people. And I'm uh, standing with the people that are saying this doesn't seem right. So, yeah, we can talk about that more. There just needs to be some clarity offered because right now there's some things that are unfortunate going on. Yep. We'll leave it at that, a little tease. A little tease for And the maybe next. by the time we do arrange it, there will have been some changes and clarifications. So there will certainly uh, be some discussions at the summit whether publicly yeah. or privately, there's some people that are seeking to make sure that there's some public discussion. So. Yeah, for sure. But uh, we appreciate your, you know, stepping in there. And obviously you work with a lot of customers, so you probably get a lot of insight to all of these. So, uh, yeah. 
So yeah. Well, um, well, we're almost at the end of time. So the best way to get a hold of you, I know that you've got careheart.org. You're on Twitter at twitter.com slash careheart. You've got the CF411. Anything else we want to put? We'll put some uh, blog posts out there for people to check out regarding CF Camp, CF Summit. Um, but yeah, any other any other things you want to add real quick or you think it covers it? Yeah, I think we covered it and we probably went longer than some people I expect it. I don't know how that is compared to the others. I don't like to be the guy that goes long. So I hope uh, we're in the time of, I think Brian was the, the, the previous longest one. Yeah, maybe. It's great stuff. I mean, some people enjoy listening and don't mind, but others want to make something of it. So I, I don't want to be the one that's made fun of. No, I, I think you got a lot of good content and, you know, people will appreciate that. So thank again, you. thank you for your time, Charlie. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks at CF Summit. Thanks again for what all you guys do. And until then, looking forward to it. Okay, have See a good you, one. Sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Show notes for this episode can be found on soapbox.modernizeordie.io, where you can also subscribe to iTunes, Spotify, Overcast, or your favorite podcast player, or a link to the YouTube channel for more of these videos. The music used in this podcast is under a royalty-free license from Sound.com and Bluetree Audio.